which is uh, something uh, that we always should be looking at, growing in, uh, and improving on. Uh, and so we are always uh, looking forward to doing uh, very practical things. So last week, uh, it was all about um, farming and growing your own food and, and all those kind of things. Uh, you know, I was, uh, I was seeing videos uh, today and just talking to different people and stuff like that. And, um, you know, if, if you haven't heard, the, the church is always getting a bad rap for either a couple of things, not caring about people, not loving people, abusing people, not all these kind of things. And uh, the sad reality is, is that, you know, of course, the uh, squeaky wheel gets the oil kind of thing, you know, um, and you often don't hear about uh, churches that are actually, you know, striving to do things right or striving to love people right. Um, and so I want to encourage you, if you, you know, are been blessed by Connect, share those kind of things. Share about what God is doing here. Share about, you know, hey, man, like I'm being blessed uh, because that actually is a good witness uh, to the glory of God. And so we do these kind of things uh, to be a blessing to the body. We do these kind of things so that uh, you can be equipped both practically, spiritually to actually walk out your life. Uh, and this shows that you go to a church that actually cares about your whole well-being. Uh, we're not perfect by any means, but we're trying to strive to be uh, godly and really help you grow uh, for your love for the Lord and the stewardship of your life and everything. So that's why we really are trying to be very practical. Even last week, uh, just focusing on, man, caring for uh, just your own body and caring for, you know, what you grow and what you eat and stuff like that. So today we're going to be talking about a very, very important topic of uh, really uh, money and how your emotions really really affect uh, your financial success or your behavior. Uh, and so today we have uh, my good, good friend, uh, Maurice Judson, he's going to be with us. Uh, Maurice is a actual financial advisor, um, and that's what he does for a living. Uh, but he is, uh, more important than that, uh, a follower of Christ, uh, loves Jesus, uh, loves his family, uh, loves uh, his children. Uh, and so he's taking time to drive all the way from Baton Rouge to come and talk with us uh, and really help us and uh, really really minister to us from this topic that he uh, has a very much a gifting in. Uh, just as a reminder, Maurice is a super kind guy. So he's super sweet, super kind. Uh, and he will talk to you as much as you want. But just know, like, this is his, so he does this for a living, okay? So uh, this is not him coming uh, on behalf of his company. It's com him coming on behalf of himself. Uh, but if you do want to have a, a more conversation with him, uh, that's between you and him, all right? Um, but, you know, he'll talk to you, but just know, I'm just, you, you all get what I'm saying, right? Everybody's got to eat, okay? So don't take advantage of my friend now, all right? So uh, if you got to call him up, you know, call him up, stuff like that later, all right? And he'll be glad to help you. So Maurice, come on up, brother. Uh, I'm going to open us up in prayer. Uh, Maurice is going to walk us through some, uh, some good stuff and help us to, to grow in this area. So uh, let's pray uh, to the Lord and go to the Lord uh, and pray for Maurice as well. God, thank you so much for an opportunity to uh, grow in this area of finance, Lord. And uh, all of us can learn something new, Lord, uh, or maybe challenge fears that we have. Uh, God, whether it be in saving or investing, or even just managing our own personal finances, God. I pray that you uh, bless Maurice, Lord. Uh, thank you for him taking his time out of his busy schedule, Lord, to uh, just come and serve uh, the body of Christ. God, we give you thanks and praise for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, here you go, brother. Thank you, sir. No problem. All right. Well, how's everybody doing this evening? Nice Wednesday evening. I tried to condense as much of this down into um, practical, um, understandable, relatable, adaptable things that we can all get. But I wanted to make sure also um, that we understood too the, the vast connection with our behaviors with finance that we were taught from biblical principles from the scriptures. These, these behaviors that we are um, called to have as Christians are strictly biblical principles. Many things that they are even doing in the world system came from biblical principles. Now, they may have abused them and misused them in many ways, but the principle themselves, the, the ground effect, the foundation of it came from biblical principles. So I want to talk to us today about behavior. Um, so what I want to do, I want to start off by, by us reading... 
here in Matthew chapter 25. And starting at verse 14, we're going to read about the parable of the talents. Um, I want to see here something about the behavior of one, the ruler, and then the expectation of the behavior that the ruler had for the guys. Um, and when we read through this, I want you to don't, let's not focus on the return that they got. Let's not focus on the, on the success that they received. Let's focus on the expected behavior and the mindset that the, that the um, individuals had towards the ruler about behavior. All right, so starting at verse 14 says, for it is just like a man, I'm sorry, just to get you a little idea of what's going on. What we're seeing is Jesus has been given a number of parables, um, preparing, showing the disciples, telling the disciples about how he expects people to react and act while they're awaiting his return. And so this is not a short time he's expecting them to be in. This is really a long time. This is how I want you to act while you're awaiting my return over this long period of time. This is what you should be doing. Give them multiple parables to show that he's done the parable of the bridesmaids or the virgins um, waiting on the husband to come. So now he's doing one on the guy with the talent. So first, it is just like a man about to go on a journey. He called his own servants and entrusted his possessions to them. To one, he gave five talents, to another two talents, and to another one talent, depending on each other's ones, on each one's ability. Then he went out on a journey. Immediately, the man who had received five talents went, put them to work, and earned five more. In the same way, the man too, with two earned two more, but the man who had received one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Okay, so after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five talents approached, presented five more talents and said, Master, you gave me five talents. See, I've earned five more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. We've heard that before, right? In other passages referring to well done, good and faithful servant. Um, then he says, okay, you are faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. The man with two talents also approached. He said, Master, you gave me two talents. See, I have earned you two more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Share your master's joy. I'm reading from the CSB. All right, and then verse 24 says, The man who had received one talent also approached and said, Now listen to what he said. He said, Man, Master, I know you, you're a harsh man, reaping where you haven't sown and gathering where you haven't scattered seed. So I was afraid and went off and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. His master replied to him, you evil, lazy servant. If you knew that I reap where I haven't sown and gather where I haven't scattered, then you should have deposited my money with the bankers and I will receive my money back with interest when I return. So I take the talent from him. So, yes, yeah, so take the talent from him and give it to the one who has 10 talents for to everyone who has more will be given and he will have more than enough. But from the one who does not have even what he has will be taken away from him and throw his good for nothing servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we can see the correlation because I'm sure um, if we're looking at this parable, we're seeing how he's interchanging some um, some verbiage that's, that's dealing with right now, that's dealing with the time that he's in at that moment saying, hey, you know, here are the talents, go do what I actually, I mean, here are the talents, I'm about to go away, when I come back, we'll sort of, we'll settle up. But then you also see verbiage that deals with, you know, Jesus' return, and when he's judging, you know, and things like that. You see that being mixed in there as well. Because I'm sure um, the an actual ruler, I mean, there's no place we can throw you with as weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know, so, but we also see, let's look, at, let's look at the behaviors. One, when you look at the behaviors of the two gentlemen that he gave the talents to, and they went out, and they actually 
did receive a return, the focus was on what they did. It was on their mindset. The moment that they received it, they immediately went out. They immediately went out and began to do the things that obviously he said these are trusted servants. So they had to have been around the master. You know, they knew the master. They knew his heart. They knew what things he liked to do. They knew which ways he liked to um, sow and reap and 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 do things to receive return on whatever gifts it was that he had, whatever talents or things he had available to him. They knew that. And if they called the one that received one talent, a trusted servant as well, then what he's saying is, you should have known this too. My expectation is that you know this as well. You know, so but because because God is a just and fair and good God, he saw that he saw that gentleman and said, you've been around me too. You should know this. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do this as well. I'm going to give you a few. I'll give you one. Let's see if you will actually apply the things that I've been showing you, that you've been seeing me do, that you've been around me wide. Let's see if you will apply those things. Or will you do exactly what you ended up doing? So he told the first two, hey, you've done a great job. And he gave them both the same response. He didn't say, well, because the one, because you, I gave you five and you brought me back five, your response is better than the one who brought me back two. I'm glad you did the two, but he gave me back five, so he gets a better response. You know, no, they both got the same response. Well done. You took the gifts and talents I gave you, and you did well with them. But you, the one I gave one talent, you did nothing with it. You hid your talent. You received. In this case, either your salvation, you receive your blessing, you receive whatever gift it was, and you keep it to yourself. I'm not going to share because I know what kind of God you are. I know what kind of hard taskmaster you are. I know you're a harsh man. You reap what you don't sow. Which, first of all, then if you look at it, they, there was never a point where he said this was who he was. He showed us the type of person he was by how he responded to the first two. He was a good ruler. So then you come and say, man, he was harsh. You know, you reap what you don't sow. Well, as we know already, if you read through the Bible, if you believe scripture, we don't reap what we don't sow. You know, sowing and reaping is a natural occurrence on this earth, in this system. God said it will always be there until the, until the end of time. You will have sowing and you will have reaping. So he basically, he placed on the mass of his own idea of who he was to try to justify his response. And we had the lesson a few weeks back about logic. He really said, he tried to set it up, you know, well, I'm going to say this is who you are so that when I say what I did, you can't say that I was wrong. But the mass was like, well, look, I'm going to use your own setup, your own foundation and still say how you were still wrong. Because if you knew I was hard, if you knew I read why I don't so, well, then you should have known coming back to me with my same talent that I gave you was not going to be good enough. That's not sufficient. So let's get into what we're talking about today, the risk reward situation. So he felt like, which you can, you can go ahead and put it up, because I'm going to go to those statistics in a second here. He felt like the risk of keeping my money and facing the master was greater than the risk of me at least doing the process he provided and possibly losing the money. So he, he chose his risk. And he had to live with the risk or with the results of the risk he chose. All right, but... So we see now behaviors. We're looking at behaviors. There was in the behavior of the, of the ruler. They all knew what his behavior was. They all knew what his expectations were. And he also expected them to follow those same behaviors. Not be perfect, you know, not be him, but just follow the behaviors that I've set before you. All right, so now let's talk about some stats here. Um, and we'll come back to sort of this idea when we get, like, when we get further into it. So some stats. <clears throat> The housing debt of Americans between age 50 and 59 is 2.6 trillion. Now, that age, 50 to 59, when I see it as an advisor, and what most of us see when we're together is like, hey, that's close to retirement age. I'm getting to the later, later part of my earning years. Well, those individuals have $2.6 trillion of debt. 7,244 closes in just the second quarter of this year 
were over 70 years old. Once again, it's showing me that these individuals are in their later years of life. They're not, a lot of them are not still in their earning years. They've probably retired or finished one, maybe even two careers by that time. But 7,240 people over age 70 had to foreclose in their home in just the second quarter of 2022. The average American household owes $96,371 in consumer debt, which means they're not including your home or any properties. This is just personal debt. We're referring to credit cards, personal loans, maybe vehicles, things of that nature. $96,371 in consumer debt. And we just took a tally around this, around this room, just rhetorically, don't raise your hand. That probably is maybe more than some of our annual incomes. But that's the average American household, $96,371 in consumer debt. So what it can show you is that many people probably have equal to or more debt than they actually have in annual income. 97.3% of consumer debt has a delinquency status. That means they're at least 30 days late on something. At some point, they've been at least 30 days late on something. 97.3%. And then adults with under 100000 in income are most likely to carry credit card balances from month to month. So that means that the whole idea of saying, hey, I'm going to get this credit card, I'm going to use it for the benefits, I'll pay it off at the end of every month, that's not, that's not the normal case for people in most of the income ranges that we will probably see in our, in, in our sort of surrounding areas and people that are right around us on the, on the mo on, for the most part. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper into some of these things because we talk about the 97.3% of people that are in delinquency. So one, I'm going to show you this too so that you realize that, hey, most of us are not in these situations by ourselves. So it's nothing to be sort of scared of or ashamed of or anything like that. Like, if we, we're talking about averages here, that means there's probably, if you're in a group of 10 people, it's probably a few of you guys that have been in the same boat or are in that same boat. So don't be ashamed to sort of hide and cower in and figure, I'm just, I'm going to work it out first and then I'll, you know, go do it. You know, that's, that doesn't work. And we'll see that from the behaviors, once again, of what we learn in biblical principles. We don't get right and then come to God. We don't get right and then go to the doctor. Like, hey, doctor, I had a heart attack about two months ago, but I went ahead and lost the weight. I did some cardio, stuff like that, got myself together. Can you come and check me out now and see, am I, am I okay now? You're like, no. We, we had that feeling. Sometimes we sort of jump the, jump the gun. We go to, hey, I think something's going on. What, what I need to do? What I need to do? And we go to the extreme measure with that doctor. But then when it comes to things like our finances and stuff like that, we like to, you know, I'm just, I'm going to figure it out first. And then, you know, I, I don't have enough money yet, which we'll talk about some of those things later too as to why we sort of hide from actually making the decisions we need to make to change. But look at that, 97.3% of total consumer debt in the United States has a current delinquency status. That's, um, additionally, they say 0.7% of the debt is 30 days late, 0.2% is 60 days late, 0.1% is 90 days late, 0.7% is more than 120 days late. But look at this, the highest percentage, 1.1% of the debt is actually severely derogatory. What is it? So the highest percentage of this 97% of people that are in debt, the highest percentage of that debt is actually more than six months late. Which means that they didn't seek our help before they got late. When they knew, I'm not going to be able to make this payment. They didn't seek our help when it was 60 days. They didn't seek our help at 90, 120, 180. They were six months late and some of them still don't seek our help. Then it's foreclosure, it's bankruptcy, never seek our help, but guess what? The time is always now. So regardless of what situation you're in, because we do live in an amazing country, there's always an opportunity to still improve, to still get better, to still get into different situations. It's never too late to do that. Um, 95,220 US consumers file for bankruptcy in that same second quarter of 2022 when 70-year-olds were foreclosing on their homes. 
um, the the um, the four, look. We talk about the amount of debt, the two point six six trillion dollars of debt amongst the fifty to fifty nine year olds. Where forty to forty nine year olds have four point one trillion dollars of consumer debt between forty and forty nine year olds. So it's not like it's getting better in that case. So we see why there's why people accumulate a lot of this debt. And it's because they're trying to use debt to get out of the situation. You know, say, so, hey, I got this, I've dug this little hole. You know, COVID is going on. My job, you know, is cutting hours or I have a lot of work for a little while. Let me go borrow more money. And sometimes just asking ourselves simple questions, you know, being very common sense and logical with it, you know, um, and asking those questions to ourselves like, man, is this going to help me or is this going to just sort of put a band aid on my wound? on this big gas that I had that's bleeding, I'm gonna just keep putting a Band-Aid on it and hopefully I won't bleed out before it heals. And we're seeing that a lot of the times people are bleeding. Now this is something that's big too. American households with an income of less than $20,000 have a mean average consumer debt of $38,480. So their debt is almost double their income. Now, the reason why I say this and I give these stats is to show you that the, most of the institutions are really, they're not really in the habit of or in the mindset of saying, what can I do to really help you with this loan? I mean, that's, that's not their number one priority. They're a business. They're, so their job is not to see, is it helping you? That's your job. Your job is to decide, is this loan good for me? Is this credit card good for me? Is this financial situation good for me? Is this good for me? Their job is to say, you're approved or you're not. And to let you know that, hey, we're here if you need it. Come to us. That's their job. So I can't be mad at them or happy for them because they're just a business. We present it to you. It's your job to decide what is the best thing for me to do. All right, so don't go to them for advice is what I'm trying to explain to you. You know, so don't go to your local, you know, financial institution and say, hey, I'm going to ask them what's the best thing for me. Because guess what? I have a living I need to make. I have mouths to feed. My business does this. It's not my job to decide, can you afford that car? It's not my job to decide, can you afford that house? All I know is you came to me, and so in some cases it's a situation where it's like, hey man, they, they came to me, they're doing bad, they need to pay this bill by the end of the month, you know, I just don't have to, I, I, let's give them the loan. And hey, I helped them this month, and now next month it's a different story, you know. And eventually you begin to run that cycle, it's like a, now you can't borrow anymore because now you overextend it. And now all these terms come up like, I don't know, what does that mean? He said something about my DTI, and they said something about my LTV, and all these numbers. He wasn't telling me all these numbers when I got the loan the first time. They was begging me to get it. Now I can't get it anymore. I've traded my car in three times, and now he's telling me, well, I can't buy. Well, why? I have the same income. I have the same credit score. Why can I buy now? He's talking about I'm upside down. Like, I don't know what that means, upside down. You know, but these are the things that happen. You learn a whole lot. When the answer is no, when the answer is yes, they get real simple. Don't tell you much of anything. So I'm telling you that so that you can say, okay, where do I need to go for advice? We'll get to that part later too. So let's go ahead and go to that next slide. This next slide will be talking to us about um, investor stats. So these are some of the stats about individuals and how they invest. 2019, 53%, 53% of American adults own stocks and stock-based investments. The number of American adults participating in the stock market has not increased since 2001. Fewer Americans own direct stocks now than in the early 2000s. That means that you own stocks on your own. It's not through your job. It's not through some type of... Um, plan or anything like that. It's just, I own these myself. I manage these myself. And 80 to 97% of retail traders. So these are, you, you hear about day trading, people that sort of actively, constantly are trying to move in and out of the market, move in and out of stocks. 80 to 90% of these retail traders around the world lose money actively when trading. 
I want to I bring up that stat if I can find it real quick here, because that's something that was real, that I thought was really important when I saw that. 80 to 97 percent of those guys actually lose money. And when they do, here we go. They lose money. And then we get to that last one. That last one is interesting as well. And this is what it says. It says, the conclusion is clear when it comes to this retail traders losing money that the vast majority of people who try to make a quick buck by trading lose money. And we'll see that happens in more than one category. The vast majority of people that try to do anything to make a quick buck lose money. 70% of the traders lose money on average every quarter. So if you say, well, look, I'm going to just do it myself. I need to get this money quick. I'm, 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 it's, it's last minute. I need to help it make some money. I'm going I'm to do some stock trading and all the stuff like that myself. 70% of retail traders who try to do this model lose money on average every quarter, with most of them losing 100% of their money after only 12 months. So we're not saying it's impossible to do it because three to 20% of them are successful. So I mean, if you like those odds, you know, three to 20%, well, I don't see why you're not investing in the first place. I mean, it's, we can cut those edges off a lot and you can still be very successful. So now I'm gonna say this, I'm gonna cut out part of it, I don't wanna be this harsh when it comes to it, but day trading is tempting and we all like the idea of turning a small sum of money into a large one quickly, but the evidence is ambiguous. It's mostly a fool's game, you know, for the most part. It's, I mean, you look at the stats, you mean, there are other things you can do that um, will still give you better odds than that and not be as risky. But I like this last one. It says, men make up the majority of investors, but the gap is narrowing. So it says, men, so when we look at this, it says, okay, we talk about 53% of American adults own stocks. And... Historically, that was about 60% male, 40% female. Um, that gap is shrinking a lot. But then as we look through that, let's see who it does it show is actually more successful. But more importantly, why? We're talking about behaviors. So we want to know if we're saying the men are more successful, why are they more successful? If the women are more successful, why are they more successful? Because it's not just because of who they are. Because the stock market doesn't care if you're male, female, black, white. It don't care how old you are. It just cares where you put your money and how you do with it. Okay, so it says studies from different fields show that men are more willing to take risks than women. However, men's taste for risk doesn't necessarily translate to higher returns when it comes to investing. A study from Fidelity in 2001 showed that women actually outperform men by 0.4%. Not a huge, not a huge difference. But if you're sitting down and you're trying to decide, you know, how to do it, I'm sort of concerned about this, I'm worried about that, you know what, you can be a little bit more conservative and not as risk averse and the 0.4% is still a decent enough to say it's not something that's dictated upon how much risk I'm taking. We look at the, now, this is what's going to show the behavior. They discovered that men are more overconfident than women. And this overconfidence leads men to trade more and do around 1% worse than women per year. So it goes back to behavior. Overconfidence. Almost a sense of pride. Almost a sense of, I know what I'm doing. You know, so I'm going to, trade more here or there. Oh man, this, that's not doing it. Let's put this one right here. You know, when most, according to this study, most ladies are more apt to leave it alone, let it go. You know, I've talked to them. I know what we're doing. I'm going to just leave it there. Even if they're concerned, I'll just leave it alone and let it ride. And because they do that, that behavior is giving them a better response. I mean, a better sort of um, return. But you know what's also doing? Better peace of mind. You know, they have a more, it's a more trusting attitude, more willing to seek out advice and accept the advice they're receiving, things like that. So, let's go to the next slide here. Now we get to market stats. And you see this is a very short list here. 
because I think we may have passed out the, um, we may have passed out some of the flyers on this if we did, I don't know if we did or not. No, so that's gonna be good, we're gonna discuss that too. All right, so if we have some, we can pass them out. Um, we didn't make a whole bunch of those, we kept them sort of limited. So what we're gonna talk about now is this, market downturns are frequent but don't last forever. Then we're talking about the second one, talking about time in the market. Missing just a few of the market's best days can hurt investment returns. And the third one, declines have been common in temporary occurrences. So you notice we talk a lot about the downturns in the market because that's when people like to call us, when the market is down. You know, every advisor is awesome, every investor is awesome when the market is going up. You know, everybody knows what they're doing. Everybody's, oh man, my, my money is up. I'm doing great. I'm awesome. Or the money's up. I don't even look at it. Not concerned about it. But the day it goes down, hey, what's going on with my account? Wow, it's down some. It went down this amount, that amount. Well, let's see. Well, we, the market downturns are frequent, but they don't last forever. You're going to always have downturns. Missing just a few days in the market, best days can hurt your investment. So let's look at this. We're talking about. There's one I passed out called How to Handle Market Declines, and then there's another one called, it's called Keys to Prevailing Through Stock Market Declines. All right, so mostly these are going to talk about some of the same overlapping ideas, but you'll see why they're important. So on the form Keys to Prevailing Through Stock Market Declines, you don't, if you don't have it, that's fine. We'll go over just something for you to have to take home with you. Declines have been common in temporary occurrences. The problem, declines can cause imprudent behavior by filling investors with dread and panic. I mean, that, that's what it does. You get concerned, you get a little fearful, you get scared, you know, what am I gonna do? The market is going, I don't control the market, I don't control these companies, I don't control the government, I'm not in control. So what am I gonna do? And the, but the solution is to realize that declines are inevitable. And they don't, they have not last, they've never lasted forever. And if you flip on to the back side of that page, you will see the statistics. So the S&P 500, which is one that's sort of commonly used to sort of dictate how the market is doing, how the economy is doing, S&P 500, they're showing you a rolling 10 year average annual return. What I like about this is when they show you the average return, they don't show you 1939 to 1949, and then go 1950 to 1959, they actually show you if I start in 39 and go to 49, this is what it is. If I start in 40 and go to 50, this is what it is. And if you will see here, in every 10 year interval, there's been market returns. But what you will also see, if you look at the actual little graph that looks like a seismic chart or like a um, heart monitor or something like that, you will see that there was varying ups and downs throughout that time frame, throughout those 10 year intervals, varying ups and downs. So what we're looking at here is showing you that, hey, you're right, there are down times, but those down times are still on your way up. Even those deep down times that are in the market, they still are on your way up. So what I'm trying to show you now is that fear is not the best response. It's okay to be fearful, it's not okay to act fearful. Because that's something that's just genuinely there. The more time you spend doing it, the more time you spend in it, the more time that you do anything, it sort of eliminates a little bit more fear. It limits a little bit more fear because you become comfortable in the cycles. You become comfortable in the process through that nature. So we know, one, as Christians, we see, when we look back at our story, we see why the first two, they operate as if there was no fear. Because they already knew. The ma they had been with the master. They were trusted servants. They had no concern as to how the master would handle them because they did the work. They had done what was asked of them to do. The third one, if he was really confident in what he did, if he was really assured in what he did, he wouldn't have given a three-sentence speech trying to, trying to give excuses beforehand as to why he did it. He would have said, hey, master, here's your 
one talent, I, I kept it for you. And he would say it confidently. But typically we already know before we do something whether what we did was right or wrong. We try to justify it to make ourselves feel better about it. When what we should do is just accept, you know what, I missed it. You know what, I messed up. You know, I should have done this a long time ago. Oh, hey, I messed up, I'm gonna do it now. You know, and just accept that, move forward. You know, and then begin to do something different now than what we did before. So the second thing here is, which goes back to that missing just a few times in the market. A few, I'm sorry, a few of the market's best days can hurt investments. We're coming out of this now. There are some stats, which I didn't put them up here, but they said that, um, I want to say Schwab did a um, tally saying that 41%, I want to say, of their, um, 41% of the withdrawals came during the market downtime. Market was finna go down, it protect their money out. If the market is down, take my money out, take my money out. Then they wait until the market goes back up and they get about a 60% increase. People put all their money back in, put it back in, put it back in. Well, let's see that. Let's see how that turns out for people. So five, if we look on that third page of that same, same document, it says, one, it says, bottom line, I'm also problem says research has shown that losses feel twice as bad as gains feel good twice as bad. So when you lose money, you feel twice as bad as how good you felt when you actually made some money. When you make a mistake, you feel twice as bad as all the times you did something right. And we begin to hone in on those things, sort of let it, and we let it sort of batter us, but then says one, the solution, keep in mind that fleeing the market to reduce losses could mean losing out on the gains when the stocks recover. So going back to behaviors, so now I'm seeing some of my behaviors. You know, one, okay, behavior says that if I put the money in, I should leave it alone. Behavior also says that, hey, if I leave, my, if I leave things going for at least 10 years, I should possibly see a return according to historical you know, averages. These are behaviors. The market has shown resilience. Every S&P 500 downturn of about 15% or more since the 1930s has been followed by recovery. Recoveries have been strong. Returns in the first year after the five biggest market declines since 1929 range from 36% to 137%, and they average about 70.95%. Over a longer term, the average value of an investment more than doubled over the five years after each market low. Don't miss out on potential market rebounds. All the recoveries aren't guaranteed, which none of this isn't guaranteed. None of this is guaranteed. Don't miss out on this because taking your money out of the market during declines means that if you don't get back in at the right time, you'll miss the full benefit of market recoveries. So if somebody up in here can tell me the future, you know, accurately, I would love to sort of let you become part of my team, I'll get you on staff, we can help you make a lot of money and do great for a lot of people. But until we get somebody that can actually predict this down to the T and know exactly which day the market will get his lowest point so we can put the money in so that he can get to his highest point the very next day, that's not recommended action. Because it's very simple, it says, okay, if we look at the five biggest market declines in subsequent five year returns, we say, okay, the first one says the biggest decline was an 86.22% decline. The very first year after that, there was a 137% incline. Then there was a, the next one said there was a 60% decline. Next year, 64% incline, 48% decline, 44%. There was a 49% decline to a 36% incline, 56% decline, 72% decline, I mean incline. But I want to look at, the, look at the average after the end of the five years for those. So it went down one year, when you look at the first one, it went down 86%. But if you just kept it in there for five years later, keep it in for five more years, you would have saw an average of 35.9% return. If... We look at, let's look at some of the, some of the lowest numbers. Look, look, that's one that where they had, the, set, the very next stage, there were actually two downtimes in that one. The 60% downtime that happened in the very beginning, 
the 19% downtime happened in the fifth year, but there was still a 19.96% average return over a five year time frame. So once again, showing you these things to keep us, to keep fear out of the equation. Keep fear out of the equation because being stagnant is the most dangerous thing you can do. And that's the simple math. If we say, hey, I'm going to just take my money, like what he did, stick it in my mattress. I'm not going to invest it anywhere. I'm not going to do any of that. It's just too scary to do anything like that. We can see just from this last time frame, that same dollar you had won't buy you what it bought you two years ago. And it's, not, it's probably not going to get a lot better. You know, because that's inflation. That's cost of living. It goes up. And I don't know why it goes up. I don't control that part of it. I don't try to dictate why it goes up other than the simple fact that people want to make more money. So they say, well, let's raise the price a little bit at a time. And we'll raise up a little bit because we want to make a little bit more money. We have goals to reach. We have investors that are looking out for us and want to know more about what's going on. They want to see that we're doing better and better and better. Let's raise it up a little bit. People want to be paid more. You want 3% more raise? Okay, we're going to raise our products 5%. So we can give you 3% raise because you're doing great. And you're, you're doing sort of average. We'll give you about 1% raise over here. Then you, uh, you, we keep you on probation. So we don't give you no raise at all. And then we go, we go stand in for our shareholders. And shareholders say, hey, man, we had a... $2 billion increase from last year because we just raised price. We didn't make a better product. We just raised the prices a little bit. We cut down on costs some. We gave out a little bit of raise. Everybody's happy. Okay. So we don't know really why it happens like that. I'm sure there probably are some guys who spend their time really doing that research and finding all those things out. But um, I'm not one of them because <laughs> uh, one, I specialize in trying to make sure that we have the right behaviors to be successful. We probably spend more time counseling people through the time frames where it's tough. Through the time frames where, hey, what is your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you want to see happen? What are your dreams? What do you want to see? What, I mean, you've been working all these years. What do you want to see accomplished from your work? What do you want, the, what do you want to sow a value from the time that you spent doing what you've been doing? And then on top of that, as a Christian, we say, well, what are the characteristics that God wants me to have just in general? I mean, just, just in general, God has certain characteristics that we should have that even if I don't need it, we just do things a certain way because he's asked us to do it that way. This is what, he has to be generous. And we say, we hear it all the time, God personally does not need our money at all. He doesn't need our money, doesn't need our finances, he doesn't need it at all. But he says, be generous. It's a heart matter to be generous. Well, when we handle our finances, it's just, it's some of the things we do is just common sense. It's just, this is what we do as Christians. I handle my money well because I care. God gave it to me. He gave me the ability to do it. He gave me the grace and the sufficiency to be able to live this life and to have a family and have children and have a job and be part of a local church and to see people around me doing these like just within handle your finances well, handle your health well, handle your life well. So in order to do that, I have to figure out well, what does he determine? What does he say the things I should be doing? What are those things I should be doing? And that's how we determine, you know, how I should be handling my finances. Those characteristics flow from one area to the next. If we can get to a point where we can establish a set of rules that sort of dictate how we handle almost everything in our life, then when things come to us, we already have a place to put it. That's what those sheets are, those budget sheets. If we don't do a budget just to say, let me see where I'm wasting my money. Or just to say, I'm about to put myself in this prison because I have a budget now. It's sometimes to prepare yourself to, for money when it comes in. When those, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep going back to because this is the point. When those guys received those talents, he immediately went. He didn't have to stop and devise a plan and try to think, what am I going to do? How should I do this? I, mean, I finally got this money. I have never thought about it. You know, you ever have people ask questions like, man, if you, if you win a lottery, what are you going to do with the money? You know, they didn't have to go through that process. He already knew. He immediately went and began to 
sow or to invest or to do what needs to be done with his talents. Immediately. As Christians, the moment we get saved, we can immediately go and share. Immediately. We don't have to be, we don't have to be the best, you know, Bible interpreter, the best orator of the gospel, any of those things. But this is what happened to me. I let me share it with you. We can be generous. Those so many things are very simple things to do. So we ask, well, what can I do in these cases? So one, let's go to the next slide, please. If you don't mind. So this goes into those things about investor concerns. So I looked up, what are the reasons people don't invest? One, put off by the element of uncertainty. So we, we, when you see these things, you're going to notice all of these things still deal with the same thing. Fear. I'm put off by the element of uncertainty. One, I don't, basically what you're saying is I don't have any control of what's going to happen with it. If I put my money here, I don't know what's going to happen with it. If I put my money in the bank, the bank might shut down. If I put my money up in the stock market, the stock market might crash. So if I put my money in my, in my mattress, my house might burn down. This is fear, fear, fear. And honestly, fear can follow you anywhere. So it doesn't matter what you do with it. All of these things have an inherent risk involved with it. So we have to look at it, you have to sort of begin to balance that risk out, that risk reward out. Say, okay, what's the thing I can do that provides me the least amount of risk but still helps me get to the goal I'm trying to reach? And what you look for, I don't have enough money. I, honestly, I don't understand how that makes sense to people. Like, if you don't have enough money, but you're trying to get money, you might want to do something with the money you have. The guy with the talent, that was his thing. I only got one talent. If I lose this talent, it's like, oh, he's a harsh master, you know. But you got one talent. I mean, <laughs> one, I'm sure that one talent, if you at least try to do something with it, he's going to be like, man, you lost my one talent. The guy got five, brought back five. The guy got two, brought back two. You know what? Let me teach you next time. You know what? I, I guess you didn't learn enough. Come follow me a little bit more. Let me show you how it works. You got one talent. Can that one talent take care of your need? May not. We don't know. So if, you see, if I'm looking at it and you say, I don't have enough money, well, that means you need to find a way to begin to generate this or make this money sort of grow, things like that. So we sit down with individuals that have been working their whole life. They're 55, 56 years old, about to retire in three years. And they say, well, I'm, well I ask them, what do you want to see when you, what do you want to happen when you retire? Well, I want to be able to do this or do that. Okay, well, how much do you have? That's, what's, what do you have already going along that goal? Well, all I have is this. Okay, well, let's work with that then. What do you want to do? Well, no, see, I'm, I'm scared I'm going to lose it. Okay, next this question. If this is all you have and you retire in five years, I'm going to show you what it will do if you leave it the way it is in five years. Can this $60,000 carry you throughout your retirement? What's your life expectancy? Now, if you say, well, look, I'm probably going to live one more year after that. Okay, well, you're good to go then. You're going to live one more year? $60,000 is great. You have a $60,000 income for that one year. Enjoy your life. Be great. But hey, you 60 years old. I'm, I'm probably going to live another, according to 25 years, maybe 30 years. $60,000, you want that to carry you for another 30 years. That's just, we're talking about just common sense understanding. It's not going to do you what it needs to do just sitting where it is. Let's find a better way to leverage that risk. Because that's a risk that's a, almost 99% of the time not going to work out for you. But at least we do this with it, it's about a 50-50 chance. So I don't have enough money, it's not a good one. I don't understand stocks. We've already shown you don't have to. I showed you right there, S&P 500. There are multiple companies and multiple different variations all throughout the stock market. There are multiple different ways they devise and put together these things to where you can invest in them. Nothing we've talked about today dealt with one individual stock or anything about the stock market. I don't know every stock. I don't know every mutual fund. But what I do know is how to devise a plan. I do understand how things work as far as how time works. I understand how interest works. I understand how your needs work to fit your goal. We can understand risk tolerance. So you don't have to understand stuff, but guess what, if you want to understand it, you can always ask questions. So that's not a good excuse to say, I'm gonna sit at home and just say, I don't understand stocks. I'm not gonna call anybody about it. I'm not gonna look it up. I'm not gonna try to learn anything because I've already decided in my mind, it's too hard. 
I can't understand that stuff. So I'm not going to even ask any questions about it. When there's probably guys on every street corner, there's about 50 million YouTube channels you can look at. Um, there's Google and Yahoo and all kinds of things you can look at to find out about stocks. And all of them will tell you the same thing. When you do, if you just look up just what is a stock, they're going to tell you the same thing. I don't trust the stock market. That's a big one. Because once again, it goes back to the I don't understand stocks and the level of uncertainty. We don't trust it because we don't know it. Or what we know about it is not correct. So we say, I don't trust it. And then also we now look at that risk, that balance of risk situation. If you don't trust that, what is your other option? All right. So fear of being scammed. All that goes into that same category. So now we're dealing more so with the individuals you may be dealing with. You know, that these guys that do this job, are just, they're not very trustworthy. You know, I don't know. They, they're all about trying to get their own money. I see them drive around in big cars and fancy homes and things like that. That is a very viable, you know, fear to have. But that doesn't mean you don't do anything. That doesn't mean you don't seek out and try to find the best help. Fear of a market crash. We talked about the downturns and the, and the, re, and the reoccurring um, uptimes that followed. And fear of picking the wrong investments. All right, so all these things deal with behaviors. One, we should not be just picking investments. We should be choosing plans and then allowing the, whatever the plan is to dictate what the investment is we, put, we place inside there. One, we should not be concerned about market crash in this sense. And not in this sense, because one, I tell people all the time, if the market crashes, well, the money you have in the bank won't make a difference either. Won't make a difference either. If we look at back, go back to Great Depression time, they were burning money in the streets because the, the dollar didn't mean anything anymore. So let, we have to begin to sort of quantify or say, um, you have to begin to get to a point where we take the fears that we have and sort of put them in the right perspective, you know, and then from that point, seek our help. So now, I've told you all these things. Let's go to the next slide. And say, so now, how do I seek help? Like, how do I know who to go to for that? Now, so we're going to talk about help in any, in, any, in any particular category. So it talks about financial advisors here, but this is any category. If I need help with debt, I need help with budgeting, I need help with, with just um, my investments, retirement, things like that, how do I seek help? One, you want to find an individual that's a fiduciary. And what a fiduciary is, the person that basically says, I cannot have a conflict of interest in what you're trying to do. I have to make sure that whatever I do is in your best interest. Not my pocket, not my company's pocket, but what's in your best interest. My job requires that, I, that I'm compliant. You require that I do what's best in your, what's in your best interest. So I, you can't, don't go to somebody that's not a fiduciary, which means their job is not necessarily to do what's in your best interest. Their job is to just make the most money possible. Regardless of your risk tolerance, regardless of what your concerns are, you find a fiduciary. So you do the same thing in any of those categories. You go to individuals that their job is doing what's in your best interest, not necessarily just trying to make them the most money. Okay? Uh, and you can ask them those questions. One, if they don't know what a fiduciary is, then let's just go ahead and not talk to them at all anyway. That's, that's probably a good, a good rule of thumb. If they don't know what it is, they might not be the best at doing it. So to conduct the interview. When you sit down with someone, whether they've been referred to, whether they were been referred to you, or whether you've heard about them, no matter what their track record is, ask them questions the same way they ask you questions. They're trying to decide whether you'll be a good client for them. Well, you should be trying to decide whether they'll be a good advisor for you. You have to be comfortable with this individual. You have to be comfortable with asking a question that you might feel is not a good question, but they don't make you feel judged when you ask it. Because you need to be able to ask those questions. You need to be able to ask questions that you've been thinking about, but you just never got an answer on. And you don't want one that rushes you either. Choose based on strategy. So it means, so when we, when we get into that, say choose the right specialist. Um, I'm sorry, we skipped that one. Choose the right specialist. So one, there are different individuals in all the different areas of finances that specialize in specific things. Everybody likes the idea of calling themselves financial advisors because it sounds professional, it sounds very elite, and things like that. But some people that call themselves financial advisors are credit repair specialists. That's not who I need if I'm trying to prepare for retirement. Some of them are um, just brokers, which means their job is to just 
sell and buy stocks day in, day out based on what you tell them. You know, you, you give them your money and you say, hey, this is my money right here. And it's OK. What do we want to buy? What are your recommendations? Well, I like Exxon. OK, we'll buy Exxon. You know, that's a good stock. Well, no, I like this stock. They're not concerned about what your goals are or what you're trying to accomplish or how much money you would need in retirement. It's just that's their job just to do that. So, so we say choose the right specialist and then choose based on strategy. Everybody had different ideas about what they like. You have some people that love annuities or insurance products. They love using those to, to provide you income. Some of them love using stocks. They believe in stocks, they like to buy stocks. Some like to buy mutual funds. A little bit less aggressive way of formulating stocks into a portfolio. But choose based on the strategy. You know what, I like that strategy he had. I like that plan, I'm comfortable with that. I like how I feel sort of going through that process. I like the follow-up plan he has. You know, all those things. You say, mm, I don't want nobody to call me that often. I don't think I'm going to like, I don't like that plan. I want one I can sort of, you know, put it to the side and it'll be okay. And if I need something, I can call him back. You know, f choose, choose based on strategy. Same thing with everything. You feel to go buy a vehicle, do the same thing. You know, finally follow these same rules. You know, conduct interviews at a few places. Never act like, I am indebted to this place. You know, I'm just so grateful that they gave me this loan. I'll take it no matter what the rate is. I'm so grateful that this person took the time to see me. I'm going to do whatever they say. You know, no, don't do that. Let's actually interview them. Talk like, hey, I know my score says this, but my mentality has changed because my behaviors are changing. So my behavior dictates how I move forward, not this is all I qualify for. Okay, and then ask about credentials. Now, it's going to sound very sort of cliche right now because most people don't do this. And it sound if you sit in front of an individual and they ask about your credentials, most of them will look at you sort of funny, you know, things like that. But it matters. Do they even have the proper licenses to be held accountable for what they're telling you? Because in my position, I'm held accountable if I tell you what's right and what's wrong. If I tell you something and what I say is completely untrue, well, guess what happens? I can be dinged for it. I can have a, something put on my record for doing it. I could lose it. I could pay a fine. So make sure you ask about their credentials. And then the last one, ask how do they get paid? Ask them how they get paid. If, I mean, it's, if I don't mind. When you sit down with me, you have a name, I'm going to ask you, how much money do you have? Because I'm a financial advisor. I deal with finances. If you're not comfortable talking to me about your money, and I'm a financial advisor, I'm gonna have to tell you right then, we need to get comfortable talking about your money. Because if not, I really can't help you. The doctor, same thing. I mean, how would you look at a doctor if you walk in and he never asks you about your health? Like, well then, what are we doing? This is a counseling session, you know? So be comfortable talking to, your, talking to an advisor about money. He's going to ask about your money, you ask about his. Meaning, how are you going to charge me? How do you get paid? Where do the fees come from? You know, am I paying you out of my pocket? Is it coming out of my account? You know, how am I getting paid? You know, how are you getting paid? Ask him those questions, you know. Um, now, side note from this too, is never decide what you're going to do based on what somebody else did. Because um, that can work two ways. I've seen many people come in and ask, well, well, how are you investing your money? You put your money in that stock? Well, that's not a fair comparison because I'm not in the same situation you're in. You know, we're not the same. I'm, I'm not, I don't have the money you have. You may have more money than I have. So we're not going to do the exact same thing with our accounts. But that can give you a false, a false pretense. Because one thing they're not going to do too, they're not going to show you their accounts. People lie. I mean, they do it pretty often. So if you ask them, they already know, hey, when somebody come ask you that, just tell them you have this. Oh, yes, I invest in that one. But if you hear all their conversations, you realize by, by the time you finish talking to them or hearing all their conversations, they invest in everything according to them. Because every person sits down with them asking that question and says, oh, yes, I do this one all the time. Oh, yeah, I do that one all the time, you know. Or some of them will say, well, no, nah, I don't really mess with that. You know, I don't do that. But that doesn't mean it's not good for you. So always make sure that we don't, we don't do it based on what they do, but we follow the same, we follow behaviors, okay? So that's how you seek help. Now, this is what a financial advisor, I'm gonna tell you, because this is the one I know. This is what they should do for you. So you sit down with an advisor and you're talking to them, this is what you should expect from them. 
One, they should analyze your risk, toler your risk tolerance and your investment objectives. If they don't take time understanding how comfortable you are with the risk, don't understand what are your investment objectives, they're probably not going to start off on the right foot. To help minimize your tax consequences. It should be important to you. Okay, what can I do now to where when I'm older and I'm receiving this money back out, I'm probably not paying as many taxes. Or does it even matter? You know, provide budgeting advice. Some of them don't like doing this part because it's not, it's, not, it's not fancy. It's not something that looks really nice on charts. But they need to provide some budgeting advice. I need to sit down and figure out what can you realistically do? You may not know yet. Well, let's sit down together. Let's go over this budget sheet real quick and see, hey, can you, can you put in $200 a month to help go towards your goal? Can you afford, do you really need to take out $5,000 a month in retirement or $3,000 enough? You may already have everything you need already in that nest egg to take care of you for the rest of your life, but you don't know it because we've been hearing, I need this amount of money. Oh, I need that amount of money. So you're thinking, well, hold on, I've been making $6,000 a month before I retire, so I'm going to need $6,000 a month when I retire. Well, they should help you go over that, those type of things. And they should help you suggest strategies to manage your debt. Not just strategies for spending your money, but also strategies for managing your debt. They should offer estate planning solutions. They should not be afraid to talk about what's going to happen after you pass. Bring your kids into the picture. Bring your spouse into the picture. What are you going to do after you pass? What are we going to do if you get to a certain point in time in your life where you can't make decisions on your own without needing additional help? You can't be afraid of tough conversations. And then the last thing that they do is make investment recommendations. Because the investment recommendations don't matter if I don't do those things before that. Okay? Same thing with doing anything else. You're dealing with a loan officer. You're dealing with a credit union. You're dealing with a bank. You're dealing with a mortgage situation. These, if you want to find the best individual, either you have to do these things yourself or you find somebody that does it with you. All right, so last slide. All right, so before we ask questions, I want to go back and sort of read what we talked about here. We talked about behaviors. We talked about the fact that as Christians, a lot of these behaviors are already prevalent in our normal Christian walk that we should be having. We hear about them every Sunday. We hear about them if we hear other ministers preaching certain messages that are actually biblically-based messages. The behaviors are already there. All right, we have to begin to translate them over into our finances, not just use them in other areas. Translate those same behaviors into these areas. We see that God has always thought about things in the long term. Even when Jeremiah, when they asked, well, okay, Jeremiah got the prophecy and said, hey, guys, we're going to be enslaved for like 400 years. So I'm, like, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, you know, but that's what's going to happen. And I'm like, well, what are you supposed to do? And he told them. He said, okay, well, God said to still go ahead and, you know, grow your, grow your gardens and, you know, marry your sons and your daughters and do these, like, basically keep living. Live the same way I've taught you how to live from the beginning. Don't stop doing any of those things. So let's not think about, oh, well, you know, things going to wrap up after a while. When Jesus is coming back, I'm not worried about it. Oh, man, you, the way the market is, the way the country is going now, it's going to go down, this and that. Well, guess what God said to do? Keep living. Keep doing the things that I've already told you to do. Keep following these same patterns and plans and processes I've always placed before you. Because as Christians, that's what we do. We do what we've been instructed to. We do what we've seen our father do. And he's always done what he's supposed to do. I mean, imagine Jesus, when he was here for those 33 years, he still followed a pattern of living until the day he was captured by the soldiers and brought in to go through that punishment, that hanging on the cross, that barrier and resurrection. He followed the same pattern. He didn't stop doing anything. He didn't stop living. He didn't stop. I mean, he took the time right before. He, he ministered. I mean, we're a very quick ministry to, to Peter while he was being captured. <laughs> it, was, it was very quick. You know, soldier come up, Peter cut the ear off. He stops for a second, put the ear back on. Just a quick, just a quick little lesson. You know, like I'm, I'm not going to get all belligerent, which I'm not going to get out of character, even in this moment. He remained in character, even through that moment. We hear about actors doing remaining in character, you know. They're about to play a part in the role in the movie, and that whole time they're acting for that movie, they remain in character the whole time. Whereas Christians, we have to remain in character. 
no matter what the circumstance is. Oh man, my, my income is a little bit low this month. Remain in character. Give, budget, ask questions, seek help, make right decisions. Man, I bought that car, I never bought it. Okay, fine, keep doing what you're supposed to be doing. Ask questions, seek help, keep paying the note, <laughs> give, if you have to seek out other income, keep moving forward. Everything that we do, keep moving forward. We have the character that's been placed before us that's already been told us how to do things according to the character of Christ. Keep following that same character. If we do that, the behaviors will get us the returns that we need. And it doesn't matter the amount of talents you've been given. The point is you've been given talents. There's nobody in here that has not been given some type of talent, some type of way or ways to do something to help out in the area of generosity or finances or building your own income or building your own, whatever it is there's there's no individual that has not been given the opportunity by God to do something and with the with where things now are in our society in our world and in this country even more opportunities I mean we, we see people that they have a like this job that I have I could take this recording put it on YouTube and make money off of that so it's like it's, there's, there's nothing you can't do now to make income. Some people, just they'll just follow you around your day. You just keep a camera around you and just go about your day and let them watch your day and guess what? Make money on YouTube. So if there's no, the point is there's no way to say that I have no way to do something. It's available. But the key that I want to make sure that we understand is following the right behaviors that align with the character that God has given us to live by. And then all these individual things will help. You know, so and couple, the reason why that's important, because right now there are many different places out there, many different people out there that's given all these ideas. This is the next great financial breakthrough to do. You know, hey, you can be your own bank now. Use this life insurance policy and they can then let it pay you. Is that a good idea for me? I don't know. I don't know what it said, but it sounds like it's the next big thing. The guys who got money are saying what we should be doing with it. You know, oh, well, hey, you know, next big thing, hey, this talk about it's going down, take your money out. What should I be doing? I don't know. It's next, that's what they're saying, do. I'm going to just do it, you know. So don't get stagnant. Don't let fear dictate what you do. But understand that fear will come. Fear will be there. But don't let it, don't let it, just don't let it disturb you. Don't let it keep, take you off of your character because the same thing happens in our daily walk with Christ. We have been fearful. We have made mistakes in our walk with Christ. And the worst thing we could ever do is turn away from God when these things happen. Turn away from your circle. Turn away from your friends and your fellowship when it happens. That's the worst thing you could do. So I'm going to go ahead and close it there as far as my presentation is concerned. And I'm opening it up for questions. And I said, feel free to be as specific as necessary or as general as necessary. If there's a statement that you would like a response to, you can do that as well. Okay. Maurice, one of the things uh, I want you to share real quick with everybody. Um, so one of the things you had talked about uh, was the stagnation that sometimes mm -hmm. we get in, the hiding the, ma hiding the money in the mattress, um, you know, really getting stuck. So um, in quick bullet points, what would you tell somebody who's sitting here right now that have, they're in a hole, mm -hmm. they're in a financial dark hole, mm -hmm. they're fearful, they don't know what to do, they're mad at the bank, when they pass the bank, they want to cuss the <laughs> bank out because it's the bank fault that they're in debt and all this kind of stuff, right? Okay, quick bullet points. Like, What would you tell them to do to go from, and, and you know, tomorrow to make a change? What would you tell them? First thing I'll tell somebody to do is one, find a mediator and write it all down. That's the first thing I'll do. I'll find somebody that can mediate my situation, which means they're not, they're not in it with me. They didn't help me create this debt. They didn't help me get into the debt. So they have, they have no sort of, like I said, they have, they have no skin in the game with me. So they can look at it from a very um, honest perspective. Find a person like that and then two, write it all down. Write the debts down. Write what they are, write the monthly payments, write the balances on them, write it all down and face it. So that's, you can, I would say do that like tonight, 
Like, sit down with it, look at it, see what it is, and then face it. Because I know so many times we're scared to, oh, we don't want to look at the bank account. We don't want to even look at it. I'm, I, I know it's, it's bad. I'm not going to look at it at all. Or I think it's bad. I'm not going to look at it at all. Face it. That's what I would say do first. Write it down. Find a mediator. Let somebody go through it with you that has no bad. They, they're not judgmental. They don't even know you personally like that, but just let them look at it. If there's somebody that you think that you trust personally to do it with you, let them look at it. But be honest about it. And then two, then the, the third thing I would say to do is um, take, take ownership of the role you played in it. I talk to people a lot about fault and responsibility. A lot of things that happen to us are not always our fault, but it's still our responsibility. As an advisor, when I sit down with clients, I tell them all the time, I say, look, this is your money. You have to live off of it. You'll be the one that has to sort of follow this plan, you know, throughout the future. So it's important for you to be willing to make this decision, to be comfortable with this decision, because when I go home, I have to live based on my decisions. My financial future won't be based off of what decisions you made with this, with this account. Whether you decide to go with me or somebody else, it won't, make it, it won't change my decisions with my finances or my future with my finances. So find a mediator, write it down and face it. And then the third thing I would say to do is be honest about the role you played in it happening. So any questions about anything dealing with finances at all? Anything about the market, anything about um, debt, anything about credit cards, anything about any of those things? Have somebody heard anything about some type of plan they heard? They want to know how does that really work? Is that really true or what things like that as well? Hey man, appreciate your presentation. My name is Caleb, by the way. So. I have been, because my plan is to, to generate passive income eventually, so my, my plan right now is just trying to, because um, I heard about the, you know, the li you, letting the life insurance become your whole own bank thing. I haven't done too much of my own research on it, but I, right now I'm just kind of trying to have a place where I can store my money that makes some interest until I'm ready to start really investing it. Mm -hmm. So just, I guess you can shed some more light on that if you could. Okay. So one thing I would tell you is this. Look, I've, I've never um, shut down anybody's idea of what to do with their finances. No idea. Somebody said, I want, I want to invest in real estate. I want, that's my next big thing. I want to do this. What I always do is make sure we have the right perspective about what we're trying to do. So I'm going to tell you everything that goes into it. So if you say, hey, I've heard about using my life insurance as my own bank, things like that. Well, I'm going to show, I'm going to ask you, okay, what is your goal? What do you already have in place? And then I'm going to show you what it looks like to do that. I'm gonna do an actual sort of hypothetical showing you this is what it looks like if you go that route. Now, this is what it looks like if you do the alternative route. And I'll show you both of those. And it's your job to look at it and say, okay, well, hold on, this just makes more sense to do this. You know? Now, some of the ideas when it comes to these, these factors that we talk about, these new ideas that come out, are one, going back to what the original plan for it is. So remember, a life insurance policy, the purpose of it is supposed to be to provide a death benefit if you pass away. That's the original purpose of a life insurance policy. That hasn't changed. The government still treats it that way. They still, um, they still uh, watch it that way. They still monitor it that way. The compliance is still based about doing it that way. So everything will still be geared towards that death benefit. So just understand that. It's sort of the underlying effect and then find out, okay, if this is what they're saying to do, how does that work and how does that work better than this other way I could do it. You know, go from there. So the point is you find somebody that you can talk to. Don't find the guy that lives and breathes doing it this way. Find the guy that can provide you with both, that can show you both of those things together. Like he can show you if you put your money in the market and invest that same amount of money there like this, this is what it look like here compared to here. But this is also the pros and cons of doing it this way pros and cons of doing that way, so that you can then say, well, now that I know what it is, I can make the best decision. So that's with anything. How you doing, ma'am? <laughs> My question is on um, mortgage. If you have um, a mortgage, and do you, with the present economy, do you think it would be better 
to take money that you have like in savings and pay off a mortgage um, where the mortgage is uh, it's from a long time ago, so it's about 4%, but I know the interest rates right now, you're not getting nothing on like a bank savings account mm -hmm. or anything. So is your recommendation would be to pay off the mortgage or to just continue paying the monthly installments for the next, I think it, it's maybe about 10, 10 to 15 years left. Well, that's, so that, that's gonna be a two part question because there's the behavioral response and then there's your mathematical response. So mathematically, it would say take the money, pay it off because it's sitting in the bank. Now that's just a very basic you know, thing, but that's, that's a very mathematical, unrealistic, not really looking at a person's lifestyle, what's going on, way to respond to that. So I can't respond that way. So I have to sit down and say, well, hey, we have to talk about a few things. How much do you have in savings? How much will be left once it's gone? What are your other sources of income you know, that you have? Um, is there another way we can put this money somewhere else where it's not paying off the more? We can put it somewhere else that maybe earns more than what the interest rate is on it, but can pay it, but we can use that to pay it or something like that. So there are a bunch of different ways you can accomplish this thing. So the question then becomes, what's your goal? Is your goal to say, I'm just, I don't want to keep paying the monthly payment? Okay, that's fine. How much is it? 40000 Okay, take 40000 from your savings, put it over here, where it'll earn you an amount, amount of income on a monthly basis, take that monthly amount, and just pay the mortgage. Because that's what it's going to do. It's going to feel like I'm not paying the mortgage anymore. But if there's an emergency that pops up, and I need that cash, I can still touch it. So like I say, it's always, people say, it's more than a way to skin a cat. It's one of the things where you can never give a generic answer to questions that are very specific, but the, it goes back to behavior. So what I said we do first, we always, you find someone to talk to, you, you, you're okay with telling them about your finances, we go through the different strategies, and you find that is that strategy a viable strategy for you. So going back to that, the first thing I would do is like I said, you lay it all out. You told me an idea of what it has, we would sit down, or an advisor would sit down, we would go over all those factors, and then they'll find out what is the most important thing for you. And if you say the most important thing for me is I've been staying in this house for all the time, I just want to pay it off. You know, it'll really make me feel great to do that. As an advisor, I look and see, is that viable to just pay it off? If I say, you know what, here's the next best thing, and we do that option, and we see which one is best, because Ultimately, if I don't accomplish that goal you had, it doesn't matter what I tell you. But if I can find a way to accomplish that goal, but maybe not the way you thought of at first, but can still provide you the comfort, but also the peace of doing it, that's what we do. That's why the behaviors are so important. That's why the process is so important. We follow those processes for every question I have with finances. His question, your question, the same thing. We follow these processes, but that's what I would recommend. I would recommend that you say, okay, I know what I want to do, but instead of having the way you want to do it already, just know what you want to do and stick to that and then let every strategy you hear make sure, does this strategy focus on what I want to see happen? And that's what I would do. Because it's easy, some of the guys are very fast talkers. They'll use words that are sort of out of the normal vocabulary of everyday, you know, people that, that are not in this line of work, and you'll get from talking about paying your mortgage off to how you can earn you 10% in the market. And he's like, that's not what I was trying to do. I want to pay my mortgage off, you know. And next thing you're walking out of there signing papers, and you're just like, I just gave this guy $50,000. That's not what I was trying to do. You know, so just make sure that you remember my goal is to do this. Show me ways to do this. I don't want to talk about anything else until you show me how to do this. And that goes back to the behaviors. That's what we do. We, we don't get tripped up and moved around. You, they ask Jesus questions all the time throughout the Bible, and he would have to always go back and like, hold on, I know what you're saying out of your mouth, but what you, let, me, let me sort of rephrase this question to what you're trying to mean, what you're meaning, or what you're trying to get me to say, so now I can answer it the right way. Okay, so it to be very, the Bible says be, um, we have to be very, um, Anyway, the point, be prudent, be wise, you know. Um, I don't want to give, uh, I don't want to give the wrong quote, so I'll just say be very prudent and be wise <laughs> when it comes to that.
Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, it sounds real good what you're talking about, but the stock market has fallen before, mm-hmm. and I know my brother had a bunch of money in it, and it really affected him not to the point of stop working, mm-hmm. but he was getting to the retirement age, mm-hmm. and it really was harsh for him, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I'm a little weary about putting my money somewhere like that because it could fall, so... Mm-hmm. I don't know what I would do. I've been saying I want to put money somewhere, but I don't want to lose all the money. I'm not, I'm not a money freak now, mm-hmm. you know, because I know God has provided for me. Sure, but sure. what I'm saying is I don't, be want, I don't want to worry about where I put it, mm-hmm. that I could lose it when I know what my age is. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, I'm, I'm glad you said that because what happens is, like I said, unfortunately tonight, I'm only able to, to share a few things. And I want to share the things that were sort of the most on the minds of people, debt and the market. Now, but there are many things in between there that can be done. That's why I gave the behaviors. So what I would do in your case is, like I said, you have a desire to do something. You know, I need to do something. But you already know some of the concerns. Well, guess what you do? I, I sit down with a person and I interview them. Hey, these are my concerns. This is what I want to do, but here are my concerns. Is there a way that I can do some of these things that I want to do while still being cognizant of my concerns? Instead of just letting those things fester in my own mind, and I might talk to my friends about it, or talk to other people about it, but I didn't talk to anybody who really had the expertise or the specialists or the credentials to provide me a way to do it. And if you sit down with that person and they don't seem to sort of curb those concerns, well then after the person you deal with. But you don't stop there either. We call somebody else. You talk to another one. See, as we have, as, I think as Christians, a lot of times we sort of, money is so, um, is so different in the body of Christ as to how we view it because we don't want to be seen as greedy. We don't want to be seen as selfish. And then we do want to be seen as generous, but we also want to take care of our own home. And then we, we know we don't, we don't, we, we're not of this world, but we're still in the world. So I know I trust God, but I still see the stock market. You know, I know that God's my provider, but you know, when the bill came, he didn't physically come down and put the money on the bill. So I, I still pay a part and make sure these things happen, you know. But the foundation of it is remembering that, remember that he said these things in his word. And I trust that he's a good God. I trust that he's a fair and just God. I trust that if he said, I, I clothe the lilies, I care for the birds, so how much more would I care for you? I trust that he meant that when he said it, not just because he said it, but because one, he can do it and he's willing. It's different between somebody who's willing to do something for you, but they don't control enough to be able to actually do it. What God is doing, he controls it. So if he says he can do it, he can do it. You know, so it's that having that foundation and then going from that. Because remember, like I said, it wasn't about the guy's return. It's about that process. So for yourself, you go through the process and you, ask, you, you share those exact same things you said. You say, look, I'm concerned about it. At my age, this is what I'm thinking about. I don't know if I have enough time if it goes down. My brother had a situation happen. My mom was in the exact same category. In some of those cases, what I say is this. One, either they didn't have an advisor at all in the first place that could have guided them and said, hey, hey, God, hey, sir, you know, we're about five years from you retiring. We might need to pull back on some of your risk in the market right now because you don't have enough time to recover if something were to happen. Or if this happens in a year you want to retire, you probably need to work about two more years to get back to where you were. You know, so those type of things that a good advisor will do. You know, so, but that's, you, you share those concerns. And then you, you look for them to be answered and addressed. And if they don't address them, they don't do it. Either you reiterate, say, hey, I remember I mentioned this concern. I don't, I don't think you addressed that when you were talking to me. Can you address that for me? Or if they don't, then move on. So if, the, if you can tell they're getting frustrated, don't deal with them. Because the moment they get your money, they're going to start saying, my secretary, you, you can talk to them. I, I'm not available right now. Or, or it's always like a rush conversation. You know, so you want to find somebody that, you can, that will take the time to um, share your concerns, empathize with your concerns, 
And then um, once again, like I said before, that they, you can tell them and ask them questions, tell them, make statements that they won't judge you the wrong way for making those statements. That makes sense? Yeah. Hopefully that was helpful. <laughs> yes, sir. Good evening. Wanted to know, uh, are there any other accounts that you could put your money in for, uh, for retirement that won't take taxes out? You know, when you're young, people take you to IRA, 401k, all that stuff will help you when you, uh, mm -hmm. when you get your, your weekly or bi-weekly or monthly checks. But then as you get older, you start preparing for retirement. And at that time, you realize that, okay, this is how much money I want to have for taking out of my 401k every month. Mm -hmm. But then you realize, oh, you're going to get taxed on that also. Yeah. So now, so that, so that's the part of financial advising that's, that's very important as well. It's a lot of guys that can help throw money in the market and figure out how to get through it. But as you can see, I can, I can throw your money in the market and almost mess up and still earn your money in the end. But the question then becomes, well, now that I'm trying to plan for actually utilizing this money, can you help me with that? So there's a pile of different ways. I always go over this sort of thing. So the first thing you have is if your job provides a 401k, okay, if they provide a 401k, which means they're willing to match what you put in up to a certain percent, always do that. If they offer a Roth option for you to put your money in, do that option. So, okay, my job provides a 401k. They match, let's say, up to 3% of whatever I put in. So, okay, and you ask them, say, do you have an option where what I put in goes to the Roth side? And then they'll either say yes or no. If they do, do that. All right, now, what they match will still go to the traditional side, which will be, which the taxes are deferred to you till it pulls out. But what you put in will be on that Roth side, where when you retire, that part comes out untaxed. All right, so if you do that first, after you get to a point where you've done what they match, now you go outside of that and you do your individual IRA, but you use a Roth IRA up to a certain amount. Now, your income plays a part into whether you, whether you can do an IRA, sometimes, I mean, a Roth IRA, sometimes there are ways to get around. That's a more specific conversation we have to have, um, but you do a Roth IRA. All right, do the same thing. You put the money in, it goes in, but when it comes out, it grows tax-free. When it comes out, it's not taxed. Those are the two main ways to, to, to put money aside to where when you need to use it, it's not being taxed, okay? Um, then once you sort of done the max you can do on your own IRA, but you still have more money you wanna put aside, go back to the 401k again, and you max out what you can put in the 401k. Roth wise at that point in time you're not worried about what they match you just need another you just need another avenue another vehicle by which you can put money aside without being taxed on it and when you need to use it it'll be non-taxed all right but so that's very specific we, we could get into other things that you can do but that's sort of the main thing I say the main sources um, there's this idea now going out that your 401k is is, is like it's a it's a scam and this and that but until they're able to tell me another thing that will give me a 100% return on what I put in, you know, we're, we're going to keep going to 401k, you know. Um, and then, granted, now, it'll help me if people didn't do their 401k and gave the money to me, but it's not going to help them, and I'm not going to see plan me. But they're giving you a match, do the 401k. Because the idea is, what happens when you get, to, when you get so you say you retire, you have $500,000 in your 401k, and you're ready to pull it out. One, do most people take all of their money out of their 401k and put it in the bank? No. So you will never pay all the taxes on that 401k money the moment you get it. You're going to stretch it out over time. You're going to say, okay, I need $50,000 a year. Well, you'll pay taxes on whatever portion of $55,000 or $50,000 was not taxed already. And that's it. So, it's, so we have to always, like I said, use the right perspective when we hear these ideas you know, that comes out. But that's what I would recommend. The Roth is going to be your, it's going to be your first option. See if your 401k matches do the max that they match, ask can you put it in the Roth side, and then you do that part, let them match the difference. If they're matching, so if they, if they don't have that option to do the Roth, still do the traditional, because they're still matching you on it, so it's, like, it's almost like saying, the part they match, that covers the taxes. You didn't put that part in anyway. They, you put in $100, they gave you $100. So your taxes are not gonna be $100 on $100, so it's coming off of the part that they gave you anyway when you retire, but do the Roth because it's going to save you a little bit more and then go from there. 
Any more questions? These are some good questions. Yeah, so what happens is the money you ought to receive to put in has already been taxed. Okay. So your paycheck is already taxed. Yep. Okay. So that's to prevent you from when you retire, which is to have probably have higher taxes, which means you're going to end up losing more than when you take No, it actually, to tell you the truth, it doesn't matter what your tax bracket is later. The purpose of it is this. When you put the money in now, it's going to grow. All that growth you get won't be taxed when you pull it out. No, I mean the purpose of getting a Roth IRA. So mm -hmm. you that's pay it. Taxes on that. Yeah. If you didn't get the Roth. Yeah, so if you didn't get the Roth, then the money you put in is deferred, but also the earnings are being deferred, but the moment you take it out, you tax on all of it. Exactly. So that's the difference. So that's why, the reason why I said that what your tax rate is wouldn't matter at that time, because in fact you're going to get taxed on all of the money at that time. So but with the Roth, you're still only being taxed on what you put in. So even if your tax bracket right now, let's say it's 22%, or 12%, but your tax bracket when you retire is 22%, well, guess what? I'm only paying, I've only paid taxes on what I put in originally, so when I take it out, I'm not paying taxes on any, but with the traditional IRA, I paid, I didn't pay any taxes on it now, but I'm paying taxes on all of it later. Even if it is 12%, I'm tax, I'm being taxed on 12% of all my money, you know, at that time. So that's, so really the key is not necessarily the tax rate, but the fact that you're being taxed on it, period. That's really the key. Yep. So that's 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 how it works. It ta you your tax your traditional IRA. You put the money in tax deferred. It grows over that length of time. When you pull it out, they tax every single thing you take out of it. With the Roth IRA, your income was already taxed when you received the money, and you put that in. All the growth it gets is not taxed. Also, it helps for people who will receive Social Security at that time too. That money you get out of that Roth does not affect how much of your social security check is taxed either because it's not treated the same way. So they won't turn around and say, well, because you're getting this amount of money from this source, we have to tax a certain percentage of this money from your social security check as well. So it pays a part in that too. It's not always a big deal, but it pays a, it pays a part just to be cognizant of as well. So something I want to say for, um, for young people starting off, people just starting off too, is one, you probably hear this a lot too, you can, it always takes less when you're starting when you have a long way to go. You'll be, you'll be, you'll be amazed at how far $200 a month can go for the next 20 years. You'll be amazed at how much peace you have because now I don't have to worry about you know, the market crashing or rising or doing anything because I'm putting $200 a month in. I've been doing it for the last 20 years. Another thing is this too. You're buying when the market is low. You're buying when the market is high. So your average share price for the stuff that you buy is a lot less. So you're giving yourself potential to have a lot better earnings over time than you will because if going back once again to use the, use the statistics to help you get over the fear. That's what that's for. All the stats are there just to help you get over the fear. That's what it's there for. You know, the Bible is here want to give us guidance, give us, and give us information stuff like that too, but it's, it says fear or not because it's like, I'm, I'm giving you everything that you need. There's no reason to fear if I'm giving you the answers here. You fear if you don't take the time to see what those answers are. And then also go seek out you know, additional help. You know, I didn't really understand this. Let me go get some additional help. I promise you, I didn't just know this stuff because I sat down and read it. I mean, I, I looked at commentary and I asked questions. I talked to Ryan. I said, hey, let me run this by you. Tell me, does this make sense in this, in this context that I'm trying to say it in? Does it fit? Because as good as my story might sound when I say it, if it doesn't make sense in this context, then it's wrong. You can't hold that. You can't hold to that. You know, you can't hold to that idea because it wasn't true. You know, so as Christians, it's important that we, we have to hold to truth. Because I don't think that'll stand. It can't just be a good story. You know, so, um, so that's important. So like I said, for young people, I tell them, start early, invest whatever you can. I don't, it doesn't matter how much it is. $50 a month, do 50. Don't assume, don't make assumptions too. It's like, don't, don't make assumptions. Don't assume that something is the way it is, you know, without actually doing some research or asking some questions.
One more question? Yeah. As, well, I mean, being an analyst, um, I paid off my house in 2020, 2012. So that's equity sitting there. Two, two months ago, I sat with analysts, I mean, a financial advisor. I, they wanted me to touch my house. I said, no, because I already have plan aside now as I'm 63, what I want to do at 66. What would you tell someone that have equity, don't want to touch it, don't want to touch it at all, but you have, you know, advisor wants you to do this and you don't want to do it. How would you... You know what I'm saying? Well, it goes back to the first thing I said. You do what you're comfortable with doing. I mean, that's, 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 I mean, that's, that's the key. And then, but be comfortable with the results as well. So I would say seek out, maybe seek out a second opinion. And then from that point, do what you're comfortable with doing. And don't do what you're not. But also be okay with the results. All right. All right, well, let's thank Maurice for coming and sharing with us. So next week, we're going to continue on. We're going to be looking at uh, some more about uh, finances. We looked at uh, caring for our own, um, you know, health through gardening, gardening, and uh, uh, Brother Kyle and uh, Thaddeus did a great job on that. Uh, we talked about some practical things of, uh, you know, actually investing and saving and, and doing those things. Uh, so I want to encourage you, you know, take some of these things we, we talked about, uh, no matter where you are, and take that one step of saying, hey, you know, I need to get some stuff together. Um, you know, the truth is, like, uh, if you're in the room or if you're watching online and you've not opened up your checking account in a long time, um, you know, that's a real reality. There's a lot of people who don't open up their bank account because they are, they are deathly afraid and they don't want to see um, what they feel like they don't have. Um, you know, I want to encourage you, um, you know, look, if you need help with those kind of things, uh, we'd love to help you. You know, I mean, I'm not putting Brother Kyle on the spot, but I know you could sit down with somebody like Brother Kyle um, and who, you know, somebody like that could sit with you and not judge you you know, and now be like, oh, my goodness, you're a horrible individual. Um, but help you, you know, just having another person, especially another Christian uh, brother or sister in the Lord to say, OK, look, you're not alone. We can work through this together. And, you know, sometimes, to be honest with you, and, you know, we won't touch on this tonight. Some of us walk in so much shame because of where we feel like we should be. And then we're not there and we see where other people are and we walk in in shame and then you come to church in shame because you're not giving. Then you feel shame when you walk out and it's just we live under this cloud of shame instead of, and I know some of you can identify exactly what I'm saying, instead of coming to another brother or sister in the Lord, confessing your sin, being open and saying, you know what, man, I need some help right? So that's what we're in the body of Christ for, all right? So next week, we're going to continue on. Uh, we're going to continue to grow in this area, and so invite some folks to come with you uh, to the glory of God. Amen? All right, well, we're all done, and we'll see you guys on uh, Sunday. Be blessed.